the presentation I'm going to do is a little bit like um, what Mary did yesterday, to some degree. And, and what it's made me do is reflect on why I'm doing the work that I'm doing. And Mary made a really good point that some of the work that's around spatial reasoning was done for a really um, interesting purpose that, that essentially was to um, ensure that people um, had a good fit for the, for the job positions that they needed to do for, particular, for a particular organisation, which happened to be defence. And that, that, that way of thinking um, has, has shaped inadvertently a whole lot of work that's been done all over the world in education, in sociology and in psychology. And so I wanted to think about why, why have I done uh, the work that I've done and what path has that taken? And it, it all comes down to one thing and it's assessment. And so almost everything that I've um, undertaken in mathematics education is because of assessment. And I hadn't realised that till I actually got the presentation together and, and, and reflected on what Mary was saying yesterday. So, and, and, and then, then, I, then this morning I started to think, well, why, why is that the case? And, and I think it's because I've been convinced for a long time that no matter what we do um, in, in, from a teaching perspective and a learning perspective, assessment drives it. And, and it ends up being the most influential thing that, that we do. So I know that um, Goran um, um, would be worried that I'd say this part, and that is, I think he would argue that, say, something like a NAP plan is designed around the curriculum, and that is that the assessment is, is, is completely uh, framed around what the curriculum is, and therefore the assessment is because the curriculum says it's that. But I've got a, um, a more sceptical view, I guess, which, which says that it doesn't matter what the curriculum's like, whatever, whatever the assessment is, is what's going to drive what people teach anyway. And so a, as a consequence, I've always had this view that it's, it's really fascinating to look at what assessment is and, 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 and think about how assessment's changing because that's the best way of understanding what's happening in classrooms and what people are valuing. Uh, and that, so uh, the, the, the view of whether I, I think assessment's a good thing or not and, and, and um, the extent to which I think assessments change, is that positive or, or not, actually has nothing to do with it. It's just more, um, in my very simple mind, that that's what we've got, so therefore we should work with what we've got. And that's, and that's what I want to try and present today with a, with a whole range of um, different ideas that we've been playing with and, and, and almost take a little bit of a history to sort of... Not, not to show the body of my work, but, but to show the, um, the work that my team are doing. And I wanted, I wanted them to come up one at a time and do parts, and they all decided they wouldn't. And then, um, and then one volunteered, and then, and then the, the rest went and saw that person and sort of said to that person, don't do it, and then they take... And it was incredible. So, so in the end, it's just me, you know? Um, even though that they've worked on this and, and they've got as much to do with this as um, I have, clearly. Okay, so this, this, is, this is what I want to try and cover, and it's, it's, there's lots of different topics there. And, and I, I want to show that each one of them uh, is based around uh, ideas about spatial reasoning, but, but above that is, is ideas that we've had about assessment and, and the way in which um, it, it just happens that spatial reasoning um, is a good sell for the things that are happening in classrooms. Kevin um, made a, a comment yesterday after uh, Christine's presentation, which basically was, uh, uh, teachers might be able to want to do this work because they know that it's worked. You know? So in other words, teachers have permission to do it because it's worked. And then, and then several other people said, no, but we'll do it anyway, right? Because we want to try things out. And, and, and part of being a teacher is, is seeing what works and what doesn't work and have that confidence to, to, to undertake that. And I think that, in a way, um, that's, the, that's the way I want to try and frame this today, to show that we've tried lots of things, and it actually looks like it's really carefully planned, and it's been orchestrated in such a way that... that um, and Tracy's shaking her head because she knows that it doesn't happen that way, and it ends up being a little bit random. But if you believe in the, in the fundamental core things, then it does look, when you 
backward engineer it like it's been this incredibly cleverly planned program, you know? And so hopefully by the end of it, you'll think it's a cleverly planned program, but you'll also acknowledge that, that, that each one of those things is relatively different in its own right. So I want to talk about uh, graphical languages, uh, which is a, um, a, a term that's been derived um, from geography and, and from um, educational um, psychology, but has been um, framed around some work that I've done with a, a dear friend and colleague, Carmel Diesman. I, I then want to talk about um, the, our view about um, static um, and, and uh, static items in mathematics. And, and, and talk about some of the different things we've done with computer and non-computer work. Um, and, and then the relationship between how, how static can move to dynamic. And I want to show you some of the items we've just developed. And hopefully, um, where's Danielle? So that some of those items will actually be ready today. But we, I can't show them to you now because um, by 5 o'clock they better be here. But I can, I can at least get you to imagine what they might look like. And um, then I want to talk about the intervention program that we've done um, with a whole, num a whole range of schools in um, this, this area, which we're really, really proud of. And we saw a bit of a snapshot that Christine showed of that yesterday. And uh, then I, I, want to, I want to talk about some of the current projects we have. And hopefully by then you wouldn't have fallen asleep and it'll be about an hour um, or so. So... Um, <clears throat> This, this um, is how it all began for me in, in thinking about um, the, the, the way in which um, mathematics items are structured. Now, um, when, when Goran um, was doing his presentation yesterday, he said that one of the things that he's really interested in is not just what the item looks like, but the way in which the user engages with the item. And so, so in other words, that, that Everyone sees, everyone sees an item that's a math, that could be mathematics in nature or science based in nature, but you actually don't see what's happening when people engage with the item. And he was saying that he in particular and, 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 and Akara more broadly are thinking about the way in which that happens. So for example now, the fact that there's going to be items going online changes everything. Well even before that, we started to, we started to notice how much... Um, assessment was changing, both in Australia and, and to some degree overseas. And um, one, one of our colleagues, um, Jane Greenlees, actually um, did her doctorate um, on looking at the way in which assessment had changed. And for those of you who have worked in New South Wales, if you remember the basic skills test, um, and so um, that, that's the sort of test that I had to um, give children um, in New South Wales whilst I was teaching. She went back and she found some of the early basic skills tests and then, and then tracked that back to, to when, um, for 2008, when um, um, NAPLAN started. And, and she took every year and she noticed that every, say 15 to 20 years ago, almost every item was a word item. Like Betty and Jim go down to the local store, um, they've, they've got 40 cents to spend, they bought this thing for 8 cents and this thing for 12 cents what did their change look like? Okay, so that, that was the task. And, and, and so there was about 85% of the items that were like that and about 15% of the items that actually had a graphic in them. And then she, she mapped that through and every year more and more items had a graphic. And it was, it was a really, really slow burn. It was almost like the graph that Mary put, put yesterday at a 45 degree angle with a, with a perfect correlation of each year, uh, there was a slightly increased number of items that had a graphic in them. And so by the time you got to 2008 um, and, and beyond, in, in, for example, grade three, there would be 85% of the items would have a graphic. 85%. And so it, it, it went from um, when I was teaching grade three, where the view was, oh, we're not really measuring the mathematics, we're measuring how well the child can read. That is, if they can't read the word problem, it's really difficult for them to understand what the mathematics is and therefore we're not really assessing what they know about mathematics, but rather whether they can digest the information, which of course that decoding is mathematical, but, but if they could read, it helped. And if, and if their reading was limited, it was a struggle. So we went from that point to, to, to we, we started thinking, 
if they can't understand the graphic and interpret, interpret the information in a graphic, what chance have they got? So, so we, 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 we were a little bit um, puzzled by that and then Carmel um, tried to find a framework for us that would fit and we couldn't find one. So, so there's this notion that there's thousands and thousands of types of graphics and so we couldn't, we couldn't code or analyse um, whether this graphic was particularly different than this graphic, whether that was particularly different than this graphic, and we couldn't get any characteristics for it. And so what she ended up um, doing was looking at some, some um, work um, by a person named Bertin, and that led us to some work uh, from McKinley, which basically was um, um, framed around um, geography. And it made sense, because you think about... Um, if, if you're looking at something spatial, geographers have to be spatial. And as Mary pointed out yesterday, there's a whole range of things with both uh, geography and geology that, ha that, are, that are embedded in spatial reasoning. So what happened? Um, we, found, we found this really nice framework that we felt fitted really, really well with um, mathematics education. And, and it, it went like this. Some items are on an axis. And an axis can either be like that an X, um, or, or like that. So an item like that could be a number line. So imagine a number line. Or, a, or it's the exact same item is a temperature graph. All it is is you've just changed that one axis from, from that orientation to that orientation. So that's a type of graphic. A different type of graphic is when you have the Y and the X together. So not just that or that, but that. And that made sense to us all. And then another type of graphic is if you have that type of information and you drop it down onto a page, like a bird's eye view, and you embed other things into it, and then you've got a map. And then another type of item is, is like this, many of the items that Mary represented yesterday, which, which they call retinal list, which essentially are about having an item and moving that item. Whether you're rotating it, whether you're transforming it, whether you're translating it, or whether you're actually transforming it in a manner that changes its, its structure and nature. Then there's another type of item which doesn't have that doesn't have that mathematical boundary in a sense. And it starts at, at, at one level and breaks out into a branch. Okay? And so that's what's a, a connection item. And, and a good example of that can be if you're getting people to map a, um, a family tree, you know, um, father or mother, children, and so on. We'll go the other way, grandparents, great-grandparents, and you bring it out that way. Or it could be something really practical, like a tennis draw, where you start off with 64, then you go to 32, then you go to 16, then you go to 8, then you go to um, 4, semi-finals, 2, winner. And so that's, that is that type of graphic too. And then of course you had, we had to capture another, we had to capture somehow a way of thinking about the others, which was everything else we haven't thought of. And that's where miscellaneous is such a good term, because you can actually put everything else in it. But, but what we found was, in, in both mathematics and science, the miscellaneous items tended to be relatively circular, so things like a Venn diagram. And that tended to capture most, most of um, the ways in which these graphics were done. So we did things like look at, look at say, a NAP plan and, and started to see, for example, of all that 75 and sometimes higher percent of items that had a graphic which ones were being looked at and which ones were, were different than others. So, um, we, we, we made this point, and that was that it seemed like because there's a lot of graphics in mathematics items now, there's a swing back to geometric reasoning. And so, if you take the history of mathematics, particularly in Australia, um, a whole lot of um, ideas about Euclidean geometry and proof were thrown out of the curriculum in about the 70s. And so it, it went out and a whole lot of that, that the nature of proofs and un analysing with graphics went out. And so, for example, with, when Stella was presenting yesterday, in the US I think it stayed in longer. I think, I think that whole notion of some of that work stayed in longer. In Australia it was removed. But what's happened instead is that there's been um, an inadvertent placement back of geometry into the curriculum without, without it being st structurally Euclidean in nature, which gets back to the assessment. So, so the assessment was changing again. And at the same time that the assessment was changing, there was a ramping up of how important number was. And in fact, there was this cry um, all over at least this country 
and many others, that children were losing the ability to calculate quickly, that teachers weren't any good anymore because children couldn't add up, and that people were, you know, you'd see on, on, on shows like A Current Affair, which Mary's like our worst show you can imagine, where just ha anything, anything that is controversial gets put on there just to make people, um, make people upset. Um, that, that type of show would bring up things like um, we can't go to the shop anymore because the people can't add up all of our bills and that, you know? And, and they don't know how to give change. So you have these person coming on saying schools are no good because I went to the shops yesterday and I gave someone $20 and they didn't know what change to give me because the, t the, the till had broken, you know? And, that, and that's, the, that's the sort of... Um, hysteria that ended up happening. So there was this all this, oh, we have to get back to these basics. We're starting to go down in our performance with PISA and TIMS and all these sorts of things. What's the world coming to? Right? So all, all of that um, is brought in the mix where the assessment was being looked at in ways that wasn't, weren't necessarily valuing drill and practice anymore. Pedagogy wasn't valuing drill and practice anymore. But there was this overall mentality um, that that's what was being lost. So there was, a, there was a sort of a counterbalance between things that were happening. Um, but um, what we began to, to find is that this decoding of information, this decoding of this graphic information, actually um, needed to be taught. So it wasn't intuitive. <laughs> and and in, jo in, in John Sweller's terms yesterday, it certainly isn't that it just happens to you. So it's the hard stuff that you need to be able to address at school. And for each of those six graphical languages, we found that the children's performance wasn't necessarily correlated strongly across those languages. Okay, so in other words, some children were good at the axis tasks, but weren't necessarily good at the map tasks, even though you'd think that they, sh they should be. Or some of the children who were good at the opposed position task didn't seem to be able to get didn't seem to be able to get the map tasks right, even though the types of information that was, that was positioned into, that, into those um, graphs you would think was similar. So that's, that's the, the way in which we um, undertook that and, and we wanted to think about this in relation to a whole range of things. Okay, so here's, here's then what Carmel and I did. We, we decided to take these categories and, and provide examples um, from assessment of where this could actually fit. That is, instead of just saying, okay, from, from the McKinley perspective of, of, the, of the strict definition of what an axis item is, let's, let's find an example of an axis item. Okay, and, and, and then start to talk about those in different ways. The, um, so then the opposed position, similar. So an opposed position item could be that type of thing, which I think is called a bar graph. Now I keep getting teacher's help or um, and also a line graph would be similar, right? And, and other information where, where representations are taught, where basically there's information on a y-axis and an x-axis and, and, and there's a relationship between the two. Um, the retinal ones, were, um, there's one example there, which, which I guess is the discrimination skill, this one, where, where basically it's, it's like a little jigsaw puzzle and the person's probably encouraged to visualise it and imagine which one would drop in. Sometimes those examples need to be turned, or mentally rotated, other times not, to drop, to drop into there. So, that, so that's, what, that's what the first three look like. And, and as I said before, the axis one, we could have put a temperature graph there because it, it's, it's in our classification, according to McKinley, it's the same thing. All, it, all that's changed is the orientation. And this is what the other three looked like. What we did was we didn't, um, and we've done this with almost all of our work, we've never developed the items ourselves until very recently. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is because we didn't want people to, to say, um, you're, you're manufacturing this stuff. That is, you've got a framework and you're creating the items to fit the framework. What we wanted to do instead was find a framework and then match what was already there. So each one of these items has come, has been derived in this instance from uh, um, items from all over the world initially for the glim. Yeah, some from the US, some from Europe, um, some from um, our hemisphere. 
So, uh, and, and what was really interesting was that we found it really hard to find many mathematics items that were connection items. Most had science content. And I'm seeing some teachers nodding now where that's, I guess that's one thing that's, that's very much embedded around some of the science ideas and science understandings um, where, where those connect. The reason I wanted to show, show this is because this is where the work started and then, we, and then I forgot about it for a while and, and we've only come back recently to it. So, so this, this part is almost bookending some of the things I want to talk about later. Okay, so... Um, what, what, we dis what, what Carmel and I decided in, in, in John Sweller terms about procedural knowledge is that if, if, we, if we didn't allow children to notice what was on these graphs and notice the, the graphing conventions, they tended to miss things, number one. And number two, they, they also um, took too much notice of things that are not important. So in, a, in an information graphic, the, the definition of it says that there's information in there that you need to look at, you, you need to be able to understand, that allows you um, to answer the task. And if, and if you don't need to look at that graphic to answer the task, it's not an information graphic, but rather it's a contextual graphic. And sometimes contextual graphics are put into items to, to allow it to give some context, but you don't actually need it. But for an information graphic, you need to have the information. But some of the information that's embedded in those graphics um, actually probably didn't need to be there. Now, you could say that sometimes that's put in because um, it's to trick you, right? Um, in other words, there's, there's more information than you need, and part of solving the task is to determine um, when the person's decoding the information, which information that they use that's needed and which is not. Now, of course, in any table, for example, there's a whole lot of information in that table you don't have to know about, um, and there might only be a little bit of the information you have to use. So imagine a table that has Monday um, through to, to Sunday, and, and the question's basically saying is, what's the difference between the person's pay across that week? between their highest and their lowest pay, right? Well, really, for a task like that, you only need to know two of those columns. You have to identify the highest one, you have to identify the lowest one, and you just subtract the two to get the answer. But in that five day, in that seven days, five of those days worth of data you don't need, okay? But for some of these items, there's lots of things in there you don't need. So if you look at the map item, um, it, um, you have to describe where Ben went and, 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 and where, where, um, how many times he crossed the track. Children had a lot of um, difficulty with this item. And um, the, they, they particularly um, have a lot of difficulty if they actually um, don't draw on the item. So they like to draw on it, which, come, which will come back to some work I'm, I've done later. So in other words, if that item's in a pencil and paper form, children t tend to get a pencil and they just go through, and it's almost one-to-one -one correspondence. I go from here to here, I go from there to there, I go from there to there, and they see how many times the lines crossed the path, and then they've got the answer. If it's on a screen, for example, and they can't draw on the screen, okay, they have to have a different, they have to have a different way of, of, of doing that. They still might draw it, but they'd need a piece of paper then to draw it. Okay? So, so the, the process changes but they, f they find it difficult when there's lots of information that they don't need, okay? So um, the next task is really interesting because the, the way in which the arrows um, move gives a fair bit of a clue about what's happening, so that is. So um, why, um, why are some of the animals, um, what are some of the animals that these birds eat, right? So, so it, it basically you have to actually understand that whole component of that graphic. And what we found when we're, doing, when we're doing this with children is that um, they, because that information is real life, sometimes they won't look at the graphic, right? And they'll actually get the task wrong because they'll have an intuitive understanding. Oh, I know what eats this thing. And so they think it's just a general knowledge question. Whereas if you change that question and, and you call it zigots and gobbledygooks and hickahockers, the children are actually sometimes more likely to get it right than actually putting the real information up. 
And, that, and so what we've done with some of our other studies is, is take the real world context out, put in nonsense words, um, and they'll actually be more likely to, to get um, a higher score. And then it, then it comes across to, to, to what are you really measuring? Okay, and then in that instance, it's almost like a nice little control. You're trying to measure whether they can understand the relationship between the arrows and the text. Whereas if it's embedded in a real life situation, sometimes that goes astray. So it's, uh, so it's, this, it's this balance. And I know that Goran must, have, must keep him awake at night sometimes, thinking about t to what extent you actually put um, real life information in and non-real life information. And, and people designing items all over the world would be coming... Um, that, that sort of thing all the time. Okay, so um, some some of these some of these um, ideas about um, perceptual skills, about uh, understanding about um, dimension, um, parallelism, all, all of these things that you pick up um, as an as, as you become more mature in your um, understanding of reading graphics has an influence on how you can solve the mathematics tasks. So, um, some, some, some things, um, if you don't notice those things or if they're not explicitly taught, um, can mean that you're getting right away from your ability to actually understand and um, make sense of it. So we spent a lot of time thinking about that. Little, little um, experiments we did that we had fun with where we'd have we'd have one we'd have a graphic item and we'd and, and we'd just change two top two things that, that were almost indistinguishable to change, you know? We'd we'd rub some dots out of a line graph. So imagine a line graph and it's got dots on it. We'd we'd take the dots off. Everything else is the same except the dots weren't there anymore. And it would change, completely change the performance of the children. Because the question would say something like, um, it would be imagine at time over distance. So imagine that in your mind, time over distance, and it, and it was how, how far, help me Tracy, how far did, when was Meg's first rest? And what it was, so it goes like this, and it goes flat, like a flat line, and it goes back down. And what the children needed to be able to do was see that when the line's flat, um, the, t the time over distance, Meg must have been resting. So it's, it's like the, the graph that Mary showed yesterday where people thought it was going down a hill, remember? So they're going down the hill now. Okay, it's the same type of thing. And the children um, thought the first rest was the first dot because they've been told when they're in year one or year two, a rest is when you pause. And that's, you have to put the full stop or when you're reading and you see a full stop, you have to rest. So they're taking that everyday knowledge and they're looking at it and, and they're seeing that. So we rubbed the dots out and the, and the, and the performance went through the roof. Because what they then do, what they then see, is the actual line, and, it, and without the dots there, they can do it. So all of these, all of these little perceptual, perceptual elements of a graphic, really, really matter far more than the mathematics content does. That's the point. Far more than the mathematics content. Okay, so um, these graphic, these graphic tasks um, mean that mathematics has changed. That's my point. It means that the way in which we have to teach mathematics, the way in which you have to come to understand mathematics, has changed. And yet, um, um, encoding is still important in mathematics. And so um, I, I want to sort of break down the difference between the two now. Okay, so, so some people in this room have seen this um, slide before, but sometimes when you've got a good one... Um, you tend to bring it, bring it out, you know? Bring it out. Only, only because I, I know the context well and I can remember um, talking to the children about this task so I can bring it to life a little bit better. But this is what you would call the good old-fashioned traditional word problem. When I was at school, this is what mathematics was. That's what it was in grade five and grade six. This is what mathematics is in Singapore in 2009, because this is a Singapore mathematics item. In fact, this is, what, this is what mathematics looks like in Singapore in 2016. So when we go into the Singaporean schools, often I feel like I'm back in year six, and that was too long ago now, but that's how it feels. 
And so this is the, this is the type of thing that, that we don't do very much now um, in Australian schools, at least from a, from, a, from a national assessment perspective. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, one is, um, and um, Gordon spoke about it briefly yesterday, was um, international tests like PISA and TIMS, um, the more words they put in a task, the harder it is to get a consensus that the translation's accurate. Okay? So if you put this item in a PISA or TIMS, um, in, order to, in order to have that translated into many languages um, is not as easy as you think. So, for example, Siddi, can you quickly translate that for me in Bahasa? Is that not fair? My point was, if, if she translated that accurately, which she would, and gave that to a, a, a group of um, Indonesian teachers to talk about, and, and they said, what's this saying? And if those Indonesian teachers um, had uh, a good grasp of English and translated it back, it would be different. It would be different. There's no way it would translate back the same way. So an expert, an expert in Bahasa who, with deep pedagogical knowledge in mathematics and, and, and deep understanding of English, city, can translate that. And a group of teachers with just as much expertise going the other way could translate it back. It won't be the same. And, and that's because uh, language conventions are different. And, and the way in which these things are presented. We, we've even had really simple, in, in our in Indonesian surveys, we've, we've, we've even had um, really simple straight items like, did you like what the teacher did? And, when it's, and, and the, the discussion about what that, how, how we have to say that for, for, for the intent to be the same in Indonesia means that we can't translate it the same. So that's why these sorts of things have, have, have gone out, while where the, the world's become... Sort of, um, more universally competitive and, 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 and wanting to, uh, the perception of learning from one another, we've, we've, then, we've then collapsed to make the, the, the items um, with less language in them. On the other hand, also because of technology and because of the, the way in which we can now manipulate images, it's easier to put graphics in. I don't know, imagine some of these graphic items trying to put those in 30 years ago into a test. You would have to draw it. The, the drawing would have to be um, camera ready and captured. You, you will remember the first articles you did when you had to put the graphs and have to have camera ready graphics and that in. It was just a nightmare. And you'd have to send all of those things one by one differently and it had to be a certain amount of pixels, otherwise they'd reject it and they'd ask you to do it again. Whereas now you just drop it all into a Word document and, and, and you just place it all in and you capture it really quickly. So because it's easy to put graphics in now, we do. Because it's easy to take words away so that when they have to translate, we take them away. So the whole, the whole structure's changed. But every now and again, um, you'll, have, you'll have one country who sort of holds firm think, um, and, 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 keeps, and keeps something like this up. Now, let's say if you take that now and, and imagine why that's important and how this relates to, how, how this relates to spatial reasoning, even though there's no graphic in there, I'm arguing there's an incredible amount of spatial um, understanding that goes into that. Even when Siddi was translating it, I don't know if you saw it, she was moving her hands. And she was doing the da 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 and da da and da and da And she was, so she was, she was gesturing while she was translating. And, and, and that alone suggests that there's a lot of spatial features in this task. A lot of spatial features. And what has happened in the past is that you're required to um, actually um, encode information in here as well as decode if you want to get it right. Stella was talking about it yesterday, particularly she was saying that when tasks... Um, uh, when, when, when people are first looking at tasks, they're more likely to use visual methods and they're more likely to use um, um, she called sp um, spatial relations before they move to analytic methods. Okay? If you have a look at these... Um, two examples, they're very spatial in nature. The children have encoded this and this is, this is their way of working out how to do the task. So for, for we had um, 1,134 children exactly do this task for us and um, about 35% did it like this. And what, what we classify that as is a, is a complete visual representation. 
So there's no, there's no analytic reasoning, at least that you can see. The analytic reasoning could be going on in the, in the uh, person's mind's eye, but it's definitely not going on the paper from that. Fair enough? All that is, is a visual method. Now the first one, you, you could argue, if you, got, if you were good spatially, and because the numbers are hugely, um, hugely large, you could do that and get it right. But the problem is, you have to be really good spatially to represent the task that way. And our view is that a person representing the task that way probably hasn't got a lot of analytic reasoning going on for this task and needed to do that. They're not doing that for fun, because they like to draw. Okay, they're doing that because that's, that's the security blanket they need in order to, in order to unpack and, and solve that task. There's a little um, sort of asterisk in the middle if you see it. That's, that's, that's where they've positioned the centre. All right? So, so it's, you, can, you can see what's going on in a person's mind by that task. Um, the, the next task is, is very similar, except this person's probably worked out, I don't need to draw every chair. This is helping the person scaffold to get an idea of what the task is. And this person's doing a little bit like City was doing with the gesturing. That, 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 that. Just, just framing in their mind the, the way in which they try and represent it. But this sort of task really can bring this sort of thing out. Okay. Um, so, just, so, so just so back to that, that's, in, that, that's incredibly visual in nature. That, that encoding um, is able to be done because the task lends itself to it. And when Mary was um, presenting um, work she, she had done from her, ma um, her master's degree yesterday from a, from a paper she um, published in the Journal of Ed Psych, it, um, it had similar problems like that where, where there was, there was a, a lot of the tasks required you or, or challenged you to, to try and think visually or, or represent things in a spatial manner as this one did. Um, but then, if, if this, I think this is taken from Singapore too. No, okay, this is, this is an Australian item. So this item um, is um, uh, different than the previous one. Um, there's less words, clearly, and there's a graphic. Now, um, there's a lot of uh, decoding that has to go on here for this task. So decoding is where you have to actually um, understand what the graphic's doing. All right, now can anyone suggest what's the hardest part of this task? Right, well done. Okay, because north is not up, the task is challenging. So if you gave this same task to grade three, I thought I'd say Goran, if you gave it to grade three and you had north up, um, you'd get about the same success rate as not having north up, say, with grade six. Right, so the fact that the fact that the task um, is orientated in a way that's not familiar, because most most of the time we teach children that you always put north up, and most maps are orientated so that north's up. So this is this is much more a real life task in the sense that north's not always up, um, and especially with GPS, north is not always up because because it's actually it's actually in situ. To, to where you're moving and which direction you're going in. So, so this type of task is, um, is, is challenging because of that. But what we found was, um, even though you have to decode the task, children still want to encode. Right. So decode is when there's a graphic or an image that you didn't develop. You didn't represent it, someone has developed it for you. In this instance, the designer of the assessment task. So graphics that are in a textbook, graphics that are done from a handout from a teacher, graphics that are put up on the teacher's drawn or someone else's drawn and you have to analyse those information graphics, typically you need to decode. But what we found was, even for graphic items where you're supposed to decode, children still needed to encode. Once upon a time, the only way children encoded was doing that. Right? Because that's not, that's not in the task. That's the child developing that. So the children has, has, has encoded a representation that's theirs. They've created the task in a way 
where they have developed the item so that they can understand it. This one, they've done the same thing. So putting, putting, um, putting um, the points of a compass there can help. Putting, putting the diagram through there can help. So what we found was that children wanted to draw on the task. They wanted to draw on the task. Half the respondents reported drawing. Whereas, whereas the, the whole of design of that task, um, I'm sure, is to encourage someone to visualise it in their head. Right? So, so if, if you think about um, what um, Mary's presentation yesterday, one, one way of, of doing that was you'd be hoping that the person would mentally rotate, that, mentally rotate the road and, orient, and either orientate a um, compass in their head or, or move the compass around so that, that the compass wasn't up. Okay? Now, of course, some children are doing that. But, but that's, that's the next stage. So, so what I'm suggesting is that this, this type of encoding is, is, is a better security blanket than having to capture something in your head okay? and, and, and manipulate around. Some children can manipulate that around. Some children can do it analytically, if we think about what Stella was saying yesterday. And analytically, they, they just know they ha that, that all they're having to do is, is work out um, what 90 degrees is from, that, from northeast. If you, if you know what 90 degrees is from northeast, you don't have to visualise it. You don't have to draw it. But that's analytic reasoning, okay? which we argue, and as does Stella, that, that, that that's a more sophisticated form of reasoning because you've actually used, had, had undertaken these examples much before. So we, we, we began this journey of, well, what's going to happen when you haven't got pencil and paper anymore? That was how our journey began. So if, if you, um, for all of these different graphical languages, we found that um, a measure which was a Raven's test. Now, I don't know if you've seen a Raven's test before. It's not actually a measure of spatial reasoning. It's a measure of nonverbal reasoning. And that's just where you've got little pictures and you have to find out which pictures in and which pictures out, which pictures not common to the others. We, we found that the correlations between their nonverbal reasoning and each of these different types of items was actually stronger than what it was for any one of the other items on their own. So our, 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 our hypothesis was that being able to encode and decode is truly spatial and it actually goes beyond your understanding of mathematics and it actually goes beyond your understanding of being able to interpret particular types of graphs. So, um, for example, you would think that if children could do the opposed position task well, they probably could do the map task well because all, the only difference structurally is you go from there to there. If you can analyse that stuff on an X and Y, surely you can analyse that stuff off an X and Y. And the correlations were really, really weak, sometimes 0.2 or 0.3. Really surprised. So it was all, we, had, we had this idea that um, th this, is, this is not being taught and, and, and some of these results are really random. So Mary's point yesterday about you know, this, this notion of a G factor, that is you've got a general intelligence that can ride through all of this, um, was, was being um, disrupted to some degree by the fact that these, these items were requiring very different things. Back in the glory days, when it was just a word problem, the only thing you really had to get right is if you could read it, then you had to know the math. Okay? So what we were saying now was you had to be able to read it, you had to know the math, and you actually had to be able to know the different conventions and different structures of these graphics in order to make sense of it. And that, um, some, some form of nonverbal reasoning in this instance, because we didn't have spatial reasoning measures then, unfortunately, um, some form of nonverbal reasoning really was quite influential, and we didn't know why. So, um, this notion of encoding, which, which means um, you represent it, or decoding, which means you have to understand the conventions, was simultaneously playing out whether or not the items were, uh, had a graphic or not. And almost all of the research until we started looking at this 
was about word problems. And no one had jumped into no one had jumped into the graphic problems. And we were finding all of these things that we couldn't get answers to as part of what we were doing. Okay, so then what we thought was, well, I mean, what happens if you're taking the paper away? Because that's that's what was starting. That, that's what was going to happen. We knew that, um, nap, nap, um, for example, that the nap plan were, um, from Macara was was being at the time thought about as going in an online version, which meant that paper, there would be less paper. And you, you knew it was coming. Most of you in this room, I knew it was coming, and we were we were, have, have, were interested about that. But we also knew that other things like Tim's and Pisa and other assessments were actually then being done. Um, more in a computer-based form, and so we were in, we were interested to see um, what's going to happen when they, when it's not intuitive that the children can draw on this. So even though many of the tasks um, in the past um, were framed around this type of um, activity, that is, they encourage you to draw, and I was always taught at school. Those of you as old as me would have been the same. You have to put all your working down because if you get the answer wrong, you're going to get points for, you're going to get marks for your method, you know? You've got it drummed into us, you know? Make sure you show all your working. Make sure you show all your working. If you don't show all your working and you get the answer wrong, you're going to get zero, you know? And so, so that, that was embedded in everything we thought about and did, whereas now it was getting to a point where that, that we were slipping right away from that. Okay, so what did we find? Well, we found, and this is... Um, we found that the exact same task on the pencil and paper and on the computer were getting different means. And particularly for the Singapore children, they did so much better on the pencil and paper than they did when we had it on a tablet. So much better, the exact same task. And we're really careful to make sure the task was identical. That is... That, that, that one didn't become bigger or smaller or easier to read or whatever because it was now on, 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 a, on a tablet. Exact same task. So, um, tasks like this, completely different. Um, task six, um, in, for example, the ch if the children were able to do it on pencil and paper, they were much more likely to get it right than if they did it on a computer screen. Not only was their performance different, the way in which they undertook the task was different. And so what was happening was, um, say for task six, the children were, um, they didn't want to draw on the tablet because they couldn't. They couldn't be bothered using the paper or, or they thought it was just a pain to use the paper, even though I showed you some examples of children using the paper. And so what did they do? They visualised it. Harder to do. Got it wrong. So as, as, we moved into a, as we moved into a different representation, as Goran said yesterday, so this spatial stuff isn't just about understanding what's on the page. Spatial things become what, what median there is that you're working with. So taking it from, from a pencil and paper form to a tablet form changed everything. Um, other, other examples. So if you look at task four, what happens typically on that task the children draw the next tree, yeah? The children draw the next tree. It's an algebraic problem. It's pre-algebra. Um, some children draw a table for that and don't worry about drawing the tree, but it's easy to draw the sticks. Now, um, when, it's on a, when it's on the computer screen, they actually try to work out the pattern. Less likely to get it right. Okay, so that's static to static, right? So that, what that means is the items aren't moving. We had pencil and paper items, we looked at that. Then we had items on the, on the computer screen, we looked at that. But the pencil and paper item wasn't moving. The item on the tablet wasn't moving. What we're looking at now is items that move. And Goran um, spoke about this yesterday. And that is when we're going to have... Um, Items based on our languages, which and we're doing this in um, in schools next Monday, where we're seeing how the children solve a task when the item doesn't move, as opposed to when it moves. So, so by way of example, on that first item, 
help me out if I get it wrong, Danielle, it could well be, the, when, when the item doesn't move, it could well be saying, um, how, how many milliliters are in that jug? Yeah? And you could have down the bottom, 200, 400, 600, 800, 1400. And they have to circle the correct answer. That's a static item. The dynamic item would be, um, show, eight, show 800 mil on the jug. What they have to do is grab their finger, push up, and let go. And now, for all intent and purposes, both tasks are saying to the children, can you, do you know that that's 800 mil? Okay? One, one um, is the, things, the line's already there. The other is you have to put the line there. And, and we don't know what's going to happen with that. For, an, for, for an, What's this one, Danielle? Okay, so, so, so there's a problem that says um, this person is this height, this person is this height, this person is this height. Um, um, put where, put, put um, what's Johnny? And Johnny might be C, yeah? On the, on the graphic one, you actually have to grab it and drop Johnny onto the C. So we're, we're trying to keep the, the mathematics the same, but what we're, what, what we're doing is we're seeing the extent to which... Um, use and movement of the, of the graphic will change. That one there, they have to, um, for the map one, there's a word problem, and the other one, they have to grab the little car and stick the car in the right direction. All right, so they have to grab the car and stick it in the right direction. So that's where assessment's going. Okay, so we've had, this, we've had this movement from word problem, pencil and paper, word problem, graphics, tasks that are on tablets, to tasks that are on tablets in a dynamic form. That's, that's where mathematics is going. It's what we're, we're trying to be one step ahead every time and, 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 and trying to have, make some sense about that understanding. How long have I got now, Rob? Five, okay. That miscellaneous one is really good. So the tank holds 120 litres, you take 60 litres away, where will the gauge be? You have to grab the gauge and move it to half. The, 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 the corresponding problem Okay, so a typical problem where you'd have a multiple choice and you have different um, numbers up, yeah? So what should, what should happen? A child that can do the static should be able to do the dynamic. Okay, but we don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> and so there's, there's two really um, interesting challenges we've had here. One is sometimes the dynamic item could actually help you get the task right. And a lot of work that's been done with dynamic items is for scaffolding of knowledge. But when we're assessing children's understanding, we don't want the actual um, graphic in the item to help you with your understanding. We're, we're trying to understand what you know. So we, we, it's not easy to actually design some of these. We found. Okay, so quickly now, just, just to reinforce um, something that Christine was um, talking about um, yesterday, and, and we did this presentation to, to, to one of these schools and, and this was, um, this, is a, this is a representation of um, our intervention program that we did. So what, what this, um, this incredible, incredibly passionate group of teachers uh, came and worked with us for five days. They um, undertook a, a program and developed this spatial reasoning program with us. They um, went, into the, went into their school and they... Um, stop teaching some of the mathematics for 10 weeks. Imagine doing that, forcing yourself to stop teaching some of your mathematics for 10 weeks. Didn't teach the maths for 10 weeks and taught the spatial reasoning program instead. And as you can see there, um, the, as, as w was happening with some of Mary's studies yesterday, the control group improved and you want them to improve. Why would they have improved? Because they were still learning mathematics. Yeah? And they were, and they were, and they were still they've got good teachers and they're learning mathematics for 10 weeks so they would improve. But look how much the, um, the intervention group improved in comparison. And they had, they had less of the mathematics and more of the spatial reasoning. And this is where we think we're the first to do, as, uh, um, as Dick would say yesterday, we're the first, we think, to do a proper study that, that, that demonstrates that um, a spatial reasoning program will improve children's mathematics. And we've got the paper that's sort of in almost 
they just, I, I can feel it today, they're going to say they've accepted it in the British Journal of Educational Psychology. Um, um, and, and so hopefully it gets out before someone else does it, to be honest, because it's a, it's a race game for us, because we, be we want to be the first to be able to show this in class. Now, the reason that our, 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 we're so proud of this and incredibly proud of um, those teachers yesterday that are taking it on their own, <laughs> the reason we're proud of it is because this is not me or Danielle or Tracy going in um, and grabbing a certain amount of children, taking them into a lab environment and teaching them this program outside of school. Right? This is the, the, the children's own classroom teachers who have just worked with us for five days, going in and completely, um, and completely changing the, the children's performance based on a program that they've, that, 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 that they've um, developed with us. It's never been done before. Anything that's ever showed that that's, um, sp um, spatial ability um, increases um, children's performance, it's, it's been done with a small amount of children and it's been done in a lab-like environment and it, and it rings to what uh, Dick was saying yesterday about BMI research, you know? Well, our, ours is not the BMI research. Ours, ours is the proper um, trial um, experiment design in situ within classrooms. And so this is probably the thing we're most proud of and this is what we're trying to springboard through to now. Yeah, and the teachers were really good at being ha happy that they were monitoring this and that there was things that they were able to do in the program they wouldn't have to do later, right? But, but they were covering art, as Mary was saying yesterday. There was a whole lot of, they were covering um, social sciences, they were covering maths, they were covering, and, and in fact there's a lot of art. And as you saw with um, the lightning talk that Christine showed yesterday, how much, how much um, art that was in, the, in their spatial work. Okay, so now um, at, at present we're in, um, we're in schools um, with, a, with a project that's being supported by Samsung, which is now putting the spatial reasoning program onto tablets, okay? So the spatial reasoning program that the teachers developed and um, Christine sh um, showed some of that yesterday was, was still in a, in, in a pencil and paper form, if you like, right? Children doing lots of cutouts, children making origami, children um, developing patterns, doing puzzles and all of that. We've got teachers now in, um, in uh, some disadvantaged um, pockets of, um, in schools um, with, with um, a whole pile of um, really cool tablets that Samsung has provided to support us where, they, where the teachers have come to have a, 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 a two days with us and now they're back in their schools and they're actually developing a whole range of these activities on, on tablets. Now, the reason we're doing that is because what we want to be able to do now is roll our program out into, into disadvantaged communities and more remote communities um, without the, the labour of having to be there because it's, it's hard, as Jody's nodding. When, you, when you're going out into um, rural areas and, and remote areas, it takes, it's, you're time poor and, and sometimes, you, do, and sometimes um, it, you get a bigger hit if they can actually see something and make it their own and you can come at certain times and, and, and work with them rather than them coming in because, I mean, as the, the teachers know here, if you try and get some people from remote schools to come in and spend five days with you, they won't get casual teachers, right? So the whole school will shut down because they can't get the teachers to replace them for that period of time. So because of the um, Samsung support, we're now getting it onto a, onto a tablet form. And what we're hoping is to be able to give to um, uh, the Canberra Goulburn um, Archdiocese this fantastic program that not only will be springboarded across some passionate schools, but a whole lot of schools. And that's, so that's our plan. So this is, this is some examples of, of, the, of the children um, using their tablets, right, in these schools now. So, we, so what they've done is they've taken some photos for us um, and snapped it up. So we're going out in to, to see them in two weeks' time. So they're out there doing this. And they're, they're sending us photos back <laughs> with, with, with the children playing on the tablets and they're finding all these, all these um, incredible examples. And of course the children are finding better examples than the teachers, the teachers are saying, go figure. And, and they're um, actually working on that together. So we're really, really excited about that. Have we run out of time, Rob? Um, we've got quite a bit of time for questions. Okay, so if you, do you want, um, let, let, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so then I wanted to talk about Elsa. <laughs> um, 
there's a reason why I'm going to eat much hair anymore. So, so the, re the, reason, the reason we're so excited about Elsa is because wanting to work with incredibly uh, passionate um, learning centres, um, educators and learning centres, and, and I'm sure their parents, on things that we just love. And, that, and, and, and basically, the, the things we love are the connections between um, what's, happening in the, what's happening in the centre, what's happening at their home, and, and, and what's happening around STEM. And so our, our entire framing of what we're trying to do is, is, is based around what we're calling powerful STEM practices. One of those powerful STEM practices is spatial reasoning, um, and the other, the other STEM practices are very much embedded in and around the sorts of things um, that these four-year-olds are doing intuitively. And I, and I tried to make that point yesterday and I, in a media interview I had to do, where these four-year-olds are doing things they don't know they're doing it, and we need to capture what they're doing so that they're inspired. And I think the whole, um, Karen and Greg would say that one of the main fundamental reasons for this ELSA program is to inspire not only these four-year-olds, but inspire their educators and their families so that this sort of thing keeps going into school. That's what, that's what we're hoping to happen. Um, lot, lots, of, lots of the work's gonna be done on tablets, um, but a lot of the work won't be done on tablets because these children, um, the, the best thing about four-year-olds and three-year-olds is they want to play. And what we're not going to do is, is, is force them to, to, to be looking at tablets all the time, but rather that the tablet will be a little springboard for their learning and their understandings. But, um, so, but I mean, we're really happy. We're, I mean, we're incredibly excited we've got the project, but we're really happy that um, the government believed in and committed to um, our idea of what STEM is. So I, our idea of STEM is about STEM practices. Our idea of STEM is not about mathematics, science, technology and engineering. That is, we don't think STEM is about content. <laughs> we think STEM is about the practices that are undertaken by these people in order for them um, to actually undertake professions now and professions we have not even thought of yet that these four-year-olds are going to be doing by the time they're 30 at, at Samsung or at Google or wherever they're going to be, you know, in, in environments that won't have, can you imagine my team, that won't have open plan, where open plan is fixed desks and chairs that you can't move, right? Open plan might well be they can move stuff around, you know, imagine. And that's what they'll be. They'll be, they'll be doing these, all of these, undertaking all of these skills and content won't matter to them because the content will change. And, and the content that's, that, that we think is knowledge now won't be knowledge in 30 years' time and all of that. So that's, that's the embedding of, in, embedding of this work. Okay, I'm not going to get time for Indonesia. Except to say we go to remote areas. We're really committed to um, being in disadvantaged communities. They're the most passionate and um, caring group of um, colleagues that you could ever meet. They come to Canberra um, in sessions. There was about 30 people arrive in Canberra in February last year when it was really, really warm in, in, in Canberra and they froze to death in this room and other rooms like this. Um, but um, we, we're working in these communities. It's, um, it's, it's quite challenging, but the two parts of West Nusa Tenggara we're working in um, one is on the Lombok Island and one is on the Sembawa Island um, and they're culturally very, very different places even though it's the same province. Uh, and we're working, um, we're working with the teachers there on a learning program, no surprise, that has a very, a very uh, embedded um, area that's about representation and about visual reasoning and about using... Um, visual methods to understand mathematics. Singapore is much more, um, Indonesia is much more traditional than Singapore even when it comes to teaching mathematics. It's very, very um, textbook or content based and very procedural. And what we're doing with the teachers there is, is opening up their ideas about, about using, um, you, um, making mathematics more realistic. <coughs> So, like there's a question, so one of the things that we're doing is showing, is showing um, the teachers how much mathematics is in the beautiful batik 
um, um, clothing that NTB is famous for, right? The amount of mathematics in that patterning, and, 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 and the women in particular who, who, are, who, who can, can um, develop these incredibly intricate patterns, beyond belief, um, are, are mathematical. And what we're trying to do is show the teachers that that's how they get the kids connected into STEM, to show that in real life, these are the sorts of things you can produce, rather than just being some sort of textbook. 